So we end, we end it with maybe the deepest waters we could be wrestling in, the eternal counsels of God, the, uh, to save and to pass over. Um, and we just kind of broke uh, and went to lunch. So before we move on, other things, um, anything we need to talk about, clarify? I, I mentioned before that it is complicated because it is tied into the problem of evil, which is a um, much bigger topic and re- requires a number of different um, careful statements. If, if there's anything I incline more towards the infralapsarian position, I think that seems um, to have less problems because logically pushing superlapsarian to its extreme appears to make God the author of evil. Um, there are superlapsarians who I'm sure would deny that and have ways of saying no, what we're saying doesn't imply that God is the author of evil. It's a bit like what James was saying about the, um, when an Arminian says, no, I am not saying that my position denies the, the glory of God's free grace, that it um, gives me something to boast in. We can differ on whether we think the way they're answering the question actually does that, um, but we do have to take them at their word. So I, there are superlapsarians who will say, no, the reason we are going this direction is to um, magnify the glory of God in both salvation and damnation and to say that nothing takes place um, without the decree of God, and that therefore, usually I, I'm not aware of places when they're treating infrala- or superlapsarianism, superlapsarianism in the context of um, theology proper, that they'll then go on and make the argument about um, the problem of evil. The reason I'm not persuaded by the superposition is because it it ends up saying evil exists because God found it useful to bring glory to himself. And I can't get away from the fact that that appears to make God the author of evil and give um, evil some justification. I think the better way to say it is that there is no justification whatsoever for evil. It is inherently illogical and irrational that either supernatural spiritual beings or um, image bearers should rebel against the good God. There is no explanation for that um, that is adequate and makes, oh, okay, that's why there's evil. You can't explain it. Um, the very fact that it happens points to its, um, its horror. Having said that, I don't think it, I think we can give a biblical defense against um, accusations about God and evil without having to resolve the question of infra or superlapsarianism, but they're kind of tied. So basically, I think what your professor is arguing is that um, this is one of the ways that we can think through this problem, and then it, ex- it sounds like he's saying an extreme superlapsarian position does end up making God the author of evil, and I agree with that. It's just that there are some superlapsarians who try to guard against that by other statements. I'm not persuaded. I think that's the place that you end up if you're consistent. Um, but the fact that we're having these questions about being consistent tells me, and I'm following Bavink here, that we're, we're speculating about matters that we don't have enough data to be sure. So if you push me, I incline towards saying at least infralapsarian seems to avoid more of the problems of the other position. Um, I think both are perhaps going and attempting to go beyond the scriptural data um, to explain um, the logical order of the decrees. But I'm not comfortable with the way that superlapsarianism answers the problem of evil. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good question. And framing it that way points us more towards this infralapsarian position. A superlapsarian position would somewhat argue that no, there's no condition, there's no reason why um, one is elect um, and one is um, reprobate. God is glorifying himself in both, and he then makes decisions. Um, I think you're right to say that one of the asymmetries is that Scripture says we are judged for our sin. We are saved because of the mercy of God, uh, and that we can't go beyond that to say... um, what was taking place in the eternal counsels of God to explain that. It's better simply to say, um, Scripture consistently says, if you are judged, you are judged for your sin. That is the grounds of your reprobation. Um, Your sin judged by the justice of God, that half that we erase there. Um, If you are saved, it is because of God's mercy. So I think think that's exactly right. I think that's one of the places. Grudem actually talks about that specifically when he, in his chapter on election, he says one of the differences is the the cause given for each. It's man's sin, and it's God's mercy. Um, It's not parallel in the way they're treated.
if we're saying that sin, that election is based in nothing in us, um, is it appropriate to then say um, passing over is based in nothing in the person? Is it strictly um, neutral? Is it God passing over because he foresees their sin? I think the best way to answer that um, is that when Scripture is speaking, it is, it is speaking to us assuming that we are in human history in the fall. Um, after the fall, that it, it speaks of mankind when we're speaking of election as fallen mankind, even though um, the eternal, the decree, the decree of God passes back into eternity past before there is a creation for men to fall. But the way superlapsarian, um, or in, excuse me, infralapsarianism, I guess we can't get away, we're at least we're hitting these categories. Um, will speak of those logical orderings is um, the order of creation. This is in the logical ordering within the, the, the will of God, not the chronological ordering, but he ordains creation, fall, then the decree of election to salvation all the way out. Um, the, um, the implication is that the best we can do being faithful to the way Scripture presents it, is to say that I think God, when He speaks of electing people, creation and fall are both assumed. He is electing, um, I don't have it up, Dort will use the language of um, out of the mass of sinful humanity, the Lord chooses to elect some. That's a phrase pointing to um, when election is spoken of, even though we're speaking of eternity, we're assuming that God is foreseeing both creation and fall. Superlapsarianism says, the degree, decree of election precedes both creation and fall, logically. God is choosing to glorify himself by electing to salvation, and it's usually, in this framework, more of a double predestination. He's electing to salvation, electing to judgment, and then he decrees to create and to allow the fall so that he can accomplish the purpose of election. I think we're... This is peering into those eternal counsels of God in a way that um, I'm not sure we can say with confidence. I'm just more comfortable saying um, that when it speaks of 1 Peter 2, Romans 9, they stumble because they were, de they were destined to do so. It's speaking of their sins um, as what is destined. It appears to be speaking of them as sinners in Adam, not as unfallen in the in the decree of creation then god chooses to elect and allows the fall does that make sense it's this is hard um i i see what you're saying and i think um we're we're at the outer edges of what we can say with confidence here but we don't want to um it, it seems to me tell me if this is right what you're trying to um guard us against is making um, making the conditionality of election somehow de man being the decisive factor and maybe this would be a way to say it man's condition forcing God's hand to pass over is that what you're that it, the act of passing over is part of the secret the secret counsel the eternal will of the Lord he chooses that because of himself in the same way that he chooses to elect the salvation because of something in himself is that I think we're on safe ground to say the choice is based on something within him, that it is, um, we cannot get behind the Lord and his choice. The question that this is sort of getting at is, all right, I'm going to do a stick figure, so don't laugh at my stick figure. Um, representing humanity, when God is choosing to save, when he is looking at, you know, from eternity past, when he is contemplating mankind, is he contemplating fallen man? Or is he contemplating unfallen man and seeing, um, foreseeing that they will fall and making a choice? That's this distinction. I don't know that Scripture ever gives us enough to say exactly. Is it because God foresees their sin? Or is it that um, the way that Scripture presents election is God saving those who are sinners, even though... When you get back into the eternal councils, sin has not taken place yet. Um, I think you're on safe ground to say um, it is something in the character of God. Yet, I think 
um, the descriptions of judgment don't say you are judged because of something in God. You are judged because of something in yourself that merits the righteous response of God in judgment. Does that make sense? I think, you're, I think the best probably we can say is, yes, it, there is something in the character of God. Um, but the way that judgment is presented in Scripture is rooted in, in the sinfulness of man. Um, but I don't want us to pry back and make God the responder to something in human beings where um, something in humans forces God to make a decision. I think you're right that uh, if we were to say, I'm tracking with you logically when you say if it's um, he, the foreseeing our sin, how is it that anything else changes? How are we not all passed over? I think partly what we're, we're encountering here is we're, um, we're on the outer edges of what we can say with confidence. And we have to affirm where we know we're certain. It is, the, it is God himself. There is nothing behind the decree of the Lord. And election and reprobation are, um, are not presented in a symmetrical way in Scripture. And beyond that, it's difficult to answer these questions. You're asking a very good question. I think that's the best I can give. Let's keep pondering it, and we'll think if there are other ways to frame that. But sometimes, though, a clue that we're asking a question that Scripture doesn't help us answer is that there's not enough data um, to, to, to draw a safe conclusion. Um, and that might be, okay, we're beginning to frame the question in a different way than Scripture wants us to. I'm not, I'm not saying you're doing that. It's just we're, we're out at the outer limits. I, I'm running up against the boundaries of what I can say with certainty and um, the kinds of things I say. I'm not totally sure. Does that make sense? Does that make sense why it doesn't make sense? Maybe that's a better way to <laughs> say it. <laughs> Very good question. Um, anything else on election? I mean, this is one of the... Um, we'll have other significant topics, but there's probably none that stretches our minds the, as much as dealing with this as we think about um, the order of salvation. We're ready to move on to the next lecture? All right. Lecture six, the doctrine of divine calling. Um, let me, let's put them up here as we go along, just so we can think of the, um, the, the appropriate logical relationship between these benefits of Christ. So, order of salvation, we have discussed election. Now we are at calling. Now, that's where we're going to go. That's lecture six. Divine calling. Sovereign grace statement of faith. So I'm going to read that. The uh, two sentences on effectual calling, regeneration, and conversion. Key, um, both of those sentences are key for setting it up. But the second one is describing what we're talking about in the doctrine of calling. So biblical foundation. We're going to come back to that. Um, and we'll talk about defending that aspect of the statement of faith. Biblical foundation, the terminology, Old Testament, the verb kara, um, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, which is a picture of, it is speaking of naming, but naming is a sovereign right of the Lord. There is something in what God calls Abram, now Abraham, is defin definitive for his identity. It's a, a picture of that that then gets expanded into more general descriptions like Isaiah 43, I have called you by name. Um, this sovereign call of God being that which determines our identity. In the New Testament, the verb is kaleo. Um, you see a couple of the texts. Again, it occurs in um, Romans 8, 29 and 30, which as we walk out this order of salvation, as we start putting these elements on there, we're following Romans 8, 29 and 30 with some expansions that other texts make clear are also part of the picture. But that order, um, the, that is the proof text if you want to say, where do we find the idea of an order of salvation in Scripture? Um, so kaleo is the, the verb that appears there in Romans 8. Um, kletos is the other, um, it's the passive adjective um, that's often, it's frequently the description um, of, at the beginning of, the, of an epistle, those who are called. Um, the, that's how Romans begins, those who are um, loved by God and called to be saints. Same language in Romans 8, 28, those who are called according to his purpose. Those, um, that picture, those verbs, Old Testament, New Testament, and that description of those who have been called forms the basis for how we think about um, the doctrine of calling. 
But we have to distinguish between three different kinds of calls. Um, yeah, let's do what we did before. I think this, is, this seems to be a good method for us to do. Let's, let me give you a definition, describe them all, we'll put them up there, and then we'll talk about them together and think about what we lose if we lost any of those. So first, an external call, then a gospel call, and then an effectual call. Now, by external call, what we mean is God's self-testimony or his witness to all mankind through creation and providence. Then by gospel call, we're talking about the, the offering of salvation in Christ, the genuine preaching of the gospel, that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then the effectual call, um, we're defining that as the act of God the Father speaking through the human proclamation of the gospel in which he summons people to himself so that they respond. Now, why do you think it's necessary that we have all three of these as part of the call? Give me a scriptural ground. Um, how do we prove that there is an external call of God such that um, no human can say, I never heard from God? Yeah, Samuel. Yeah, Romans 1, 20, is that what you said? Yeah, his divine power and attributes have been, yeah. Yeah, that's, I think it's to 1, 20. We'll just say Romans 1, because forms a feature of the argument, not just in one verse. It's, it's part of the pattern that um, they, they knew God, and yet you refuse to honor him as God. Uh, Psalms 19. Yeah. Acts 17. Um, that's not, he has not left himself without a witness. That's Acts 14, isn't it? 17 is the preaching on the, um, in, the, um, in Athens, right? That's what we're thinking. I can't remember the phrase he uses there, but our, yeah. So why is that, um, why do we think that's a necessary part of what we speak of when we speak of call? What do we lose if we lose, say, well, we have a gospel call and an effectual call, but the only time people begin to hear the call of God is when God, when the gospel is preached to them. What would be lost if we spoke of that? Part of our understanding of the doctrine of the image of God relates to this external call. In fact, um, yeah, go ahead, yes, then we'll, we'll riff on that. So... That's the necessity of this call. The, yeah. But, so that points to a, a distinction. This call is not sufficient for salvation, is it? Because Romans 10 makes clear we must preach the gospel. Let me go back on this one for one moment, though. Um, one of the, um, not a founder, but a key figure in Westminster Seminary's history, a man named Cornelius Van Til. Um, he's very helpful in bringing out some aspects of um, our understanding of the image of God. One of his arguments is that because of our creation in the image of God, not only are we able to perceive God's divine attributes, you know, Romans 1 language, from looking at creation, that every human being sees in the created world testimony to the creator. He argues that even in our own self-consciousness, our awareness of ourselves as individuals, that we cannot help but um, encounter the revelation of God. In other words, um, Calvin's famous opening to um, the Institutes. All the true and sound wisdom that we possess um, is knowledge of God and of ourselves. And which comes first is difficult to say. I'm paraphrasing him. Um, knowledge of God and knowledge of ourselves are intrinsically related, such that you can't really distinguish. I know myself, and even in knowing myself, I know I am a creature. Um, and therefore, that points me to a creator. And in knowing God, I realize he is God and I am not, so I come to know my own identity all that's bound up by external call, we mean all of that. It is impossible to escape the revelation of God. Uh, that same man, Cornelius Van Til, would say, God is man's habitat, to use language from, um, you know, from the, the biological world. Where do you find man? Existing in God and aware of that existence, even when we suppress that knowledge. So the picture in Romans 1 is like, if you ever try to take a, something that floats, um, like a flotation device for um, swimming in the water, and you try to force it under the water, something that's filled with air, it's actively resisting you. The more you push, the more it is pushing back. That's the picture of how we suppress this external call. Um, we cannot get away from it. Other thoughts on, so we'll move to, you're exactly right. This is absolutely necessary, Romans 10. Um, other thoughts on this, what we'd lose if we said we only have that gospel call and the effectual call. How does this relate to the final judgment? <laughs> this is one of those moments when you have children, 
you're, you learn lots about yourself and lots about human sinfulness. Um, one of those moments where like, oh, wow, that is, that is telling me something important. My f- firstborn son was probably know, eight or nine months old. Um, he was able to crawl and he was moving. So now all of a sudden, instead of just being able to set him down and control what he, you know, he encounters, he's off. And we had in our dining room a potted plant that, uh, you know, plant in a, in a um, basket with dirt in it. And he started getting into that. And we would tell him, no, Elliot, you can't do that. Um, and we would pull him away, take his hand away, slide him back. And there was some point, it wasn't very long, um, you have to make sure he understands what the word no means, you know, make clear by our actions. When we say no, that's what we mean. But I have a very distinct memory of him at a young age, not very long into this process, um, crawling towards it. I was sitting at the table. He's about from me to the piano. I looked at him. I said, Elliot, no, do not touch that. And he turned and looked me right in the eyes, made direct eye contact, and then grabbed it and threw it on the floor. Like, okay. We have now entered, this is no longer innocence. You knew, you made eye contact, you locked eyes, and in that interchange, let me know, I reject your will for my life. (laughs) In the simple act of putting dirt on the floor, the sinfulness of his heart was on display. And it is stuck in my mind. The external call is saying there is no one who has not made eye contact with God. Though we um, do not have the fullness of the gospel call, It's not as though God has revealed an inadequate revelation of himself. It's enough for us to know he is there. He is the creator. He is good. The world itself testifies to that. We know his invisible attributes, and we have looked him in the eye and said, I reject your will for my life. It's very important because it grounds how we think about God's righteousness in judging those who have never heard the gospel call. There is no hypothetical individual who lives so far removed from civilization that they have never encountered God and are condemned without having any knowledge of God. Everyone has that knowledge of God such that our, what's in our hearts is revealed. My son didn't need to know, you know, why did I say no? Who am I? All that mattered in that moment is it's a contest of wills. This is the person I should obey and I am clearly going to reject that. And it's the same way. Um, without knowing the fullness of the gospel, we know enough to know He is God. We are not. We owe him our obedience. And that very fact prompts us to say, I reject you. It's a subtle, but it's we lose a lot if we lose this sense. Other thoughts on that one before we talk about now gospel call. All right. Give me biblical text. um, Speaking of a of a gospel call. What does it mean um, when it says that God? Remember, we're talking about God, even though the human preacher is one of the ways this happens. How does God offer the gospel? What texts speak of how God offers the gospel to the world? No, there's a, there is a very profound sense that how does God extend the gospel? He sends the Son. And that, again, taps on that Johannine theme of the, the Son is the one whom the Father has sent. Um, so yeah, that's a significant, how do we know that God intends to offer the gospel freely? Christ came into the world. Other texts. Acts 17. Yeah, read the... Yeah, and it goes on to speak of the coming of Christ. For he, isn't that the next verse? For he is appointed a day in which he will judge the world through the man whom he has raised from the dead. So yeah, it's interesting that we're citing that as both external call and gospel call. Both are appropriate. They're, they're, he's speaking of both there. Yeah, Brian. Yeah, so we'll just say for shorthand, Mark 1, which includes both excuse me, the voice crying in the wilderness and then Christ 1.15 saying, repent and believe in the gospel. Great Commission, yep. There's one that we, uh, that we haven't listed up here that somebody said earlier. What's another key text that says the necessity of the gospel call? Romans. Yeah, Romans 10. That was what Issachar was citing. That's one of the clearest. Um, Romans 10 is a clear offer. So how do you respond to the person who says, if the effectual call is necessary? In other words, if... Um, if no one can respond to this gospel call unless the Lord changes their hearts, this gospel offer isn't genuine. It's a fake. How would you respond to someone who says that God is not really offering um, the Son because He's only going to save people that He makes an effectual call to? How do you respond to that? Yeah, it's a, at one level, it's a challenge that you can start thinking, all right, how do I reconcile it? The other is, we're commanded to. Not get, we're not told how to resolve all of those problems, but we have a clear command that if we don't, we disobey. Yeah. Yeah, which 
the point of that is not to make you step back and think, hmm, is he going to reveal the Father to me? I don't know if I should come. The point of that is to say, how do you know your one to me is re revealed? The Father? Come. Respond, and you will receive the revelation of the Father and the Son. That's how you know. Obey the summons, and the Lord will provide what is necessary. Um, it's a genuine offer. That's why the statement of faith begins with, God commands the gospel to be proclaimed to all people everywhere. And we cite Matthew 28, Luke 24, Acts 17, Romans 10, um, and Romans 15, 20, which is, I think, that's the, Paul's ambition to preach, make the gospel known by preaching to those who have not heard. Um, I think that's the text we're citing there. So we clear on, this is, if we had no other response, we say, look at all these scriptures that say that God makes a genuine offer. Either we're going to call God a liar, um, or we say, we simply obey those. We preach the gospel. Now, deal with the objection. All right, that's all that's necessary. We preach, and then man will be able to respond on their own if they choose to. I think what we go back to is the picture A.B. raised. Um, it's in a different context. We can use the same sort of image. There is no one who will say, I heard this call, and I wanted to respond, but I couldn't because the Lord didn't give me what I needed. In the same way that we'll say, there is no one who will say, um, I wanted to save, but to be saved, but I called, but I wasn't one of the elect. Um, so God refused to offer. Actually, in that context, let me read this quote. This is the one I referenced earlier from Bavink. Um, talking about the genuineness of the gospel call, he said, those who despise the gospel cannot appeal to their helplessness, for they do not reject it because they are helpless. If that were so, they would appeal to the grace of God, which offers them the salvation. But they reject the gospel, rather, because they feel strongly that they can save themselves and because they mean to be saved without the grace of God. In other words, the very freeness of the offer reveals our hearts. If our response is, I'm dead, I can't bring anything to the table, they say, good, that's the kind of gospel we're offering. If our impulse is, I don't like to be told I'm dead, um, I think I bring something to the table, then we're rejecting the gospel not because we're helpless, but because there's something in it that offends us. Now that doesn't, that doesn't completely answer the question you're, you're raising. I think the answer to that question, if someone says, if all these people are dead, is it, um, is it cruel to make that offer? And I think that's where we say, these are, these are bound together. God has promised that the gospel will bring results. And it will bring results because it is a gospel capable of saving people who need an effectual call. Does that make sense? How do we know from Scripture, let's, let's phrase it that way, how do we know from Scripture that the effectual call is also part of what must take place? Why aren't these two enough? And give me biblical, let's give us some biblical points here for this one. John 6. Yep. Which is a one, John 6 is such a wonderful text because it blends so many things. All who come to me I will not cast out. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Um, holding the, if you're inclined to think, well, those can't be both true, then Jesus... <laughs> gives us quite a problem because in one sermon, Jesus is affirming both the sovereignty of God in drawing and the free offer of the gospel. Good. What else? Acts 16. Is that uh, the Lord opening the heart of Lydia? So, yeah. The Lord opened her heart to believe. What else? And we, could, we could think of several examples from Ezekiel. It's not a minor theme in Ezekiel, is it? Ezekiel 16, we could add Ezekiel 37. Yeah. Um, actually, we could say 36 and 37 because 36 speaks of the, I will take, remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, um, which is getting into regeneration, but we're, we're, we're pointing to the sovereign work of God that, requires, um, that is required for a human heart to respond. Anything else on the effectual calling? The... Not many were called. That calling plays it to be a, a prominent theme in that um, in that first chapter. Thirteen, thirteen forty-eight. Okay, read that one for me. So, we have these three elements, and even in the text we've read and begin discussing um, for the effectual call, we're both beginning to link to regeneration, which we'll talk about next. And that text that you just cited, Amon, also speaks of appointing to eternal life. There's there's a um, unity between the doctrine of election, the doctrine of calling, the doctrine of regeneration. They're distinguishable. Excuse me. We can look at different parts of them and say these are different aspects, but we're also seeing the way they're an integrated work. Um, those whom God appointed to eternal life, 
He calls through a gospel call and guarantees the ability to respond, which also includes the, Acts thir- or the Ezekiel 36 gift of a new heart, a living heart that is able to respond in conversion and faith. Does that make sense how they're, they're woven together, even though we're distinguishing different aspects? Um, we shouldn't think of it as though election, election has a you know, steel wall between it and calling, which has a steel wall between it and regeneration. There is a unity to all these benefits of Christ. But it's helpful to distinguish them because Scripture uses slightly different terminology and speaks of them as accomplishing different aspects um, of our need. Calling is a beautiful picture because it, it portrays the, um, the sovereign initiative of God. There was a, a song that we used to sing in Sovereign Grace. Overall, it wasn't that great of a song. Uh, that's why it sort of, it's one of those songs that worked for a while and then it kind of died out. But there was one line that has stuck with me. It, uh, it spoke of... Um, the Father standing up from His throne, opening His arms as He called out my name. It's using picture from um, you know, the Father and the prodigal Son and, and highlighting that this, this doctrine of calling is pointing to the, um, the priority of God's initiative. That it is God who summons us and His summons brings us to life and guarantees all that is necessary and secures for us regeneration and moving on but it preserves the priority of God in a, in a very beautiful way that um, we're affected by the image of a father who stands up and calls us, my son, come, live. Um, that's part of what's brought out in this doctrine. Any thoughts on that? This is, this is nowhere near as challenging to think through as a, as a lecture and, and the deep end of the pool that we're in there. We can move in a minute to regeneration, but other thoughts on how all these go together? We've Okay, yeah, like the prevenient and all those kinds of, yeah. The way they speak of those, um, it has some parallels to this, but usually the way prevenient grace is thought of is it's, um, what would be the best illustration? It's almost like this. It's like prevenient grace is not a, not a personal interaction of the, of the Lord, and it's not tied to the message, like the gospel call is tied to the preaching of the message. It's it's almost like um, in a closed room, God filling the room with enough water to raise everything in the room up to a level where we can then reach up and respond to the gospel on our own. It's, a, it's universal. It is there for all people, but it can be rejected. Um, and it's not, as I understand the way they frame it, it's not tied to the proclamation of the gospel. So we're saying this external call is universal, But it condemns us because it exposes the hardness of our hearts and our unwillingness to obey the Lord. The eye contact and we we reject Him. This is a call that goes out um, through the world, but it is a call that takes place through means, the preaching of the gospel. And so it's not like that universal raising of the condition of all to the point where we are able to reach what we couldn't reach before. Um, Prevenient grace would be more like that in an Armenian scheme, which then we are able to respond and I, I think the way it would typically be phrased, that enables us to respond and reach towards saving grace, which then secures the gift of regeneration. But it makes an intermediate step between um, our deadness and the effectual call of the Lord. And it, it implies that that's a universal um, additional gift of God to fallen mankind that can be rejected, which I don't think fits the biblical data. Does that make sense? I'm always slightly puzzled when I read those descriptions because, um, one, I've never read anyone explain adequately, in my opinion, where did you get these terms? Where, where do you see this in Scripture, that these, these multiple different kinds of grace? Um, and to my memory, um, Dort and, or not Dort, the, um, the Arminians at Dort will use prevenient grace in one way. Wesley multiplies it and adds even more categories. I think he has a couple more categories. Um, so they're all using it in slightly different ways. It's sort of like they're, um, they're bringing in some additional categories to explain away something that Scripture is pretty clear about, that we're totally depraved and it is the sovereign work of God that grants us regeneration based on nothing in and of ourselves. So I find it complicated when they talk about these different kinds of prevenient grace, cooperating grace. Um, it seems to be multiplying categories that aren't in Scripture. Um, and you kind of have to ask each individual thinker, all right, what do you mean by this? But usually prevenient grace is like someone flooding the room to raise the level just enough that we can do something on our own. Um, yet 
I guess we could choose to sink back down to the bottom. I guess that's the picture of the resistibility of provenient grace. Does that somewhat help answer? Yeah. So we have to think, how does Scripture teach us um, to think about that person? At least two categories come to mind. One, all these texts indicate we should be eager to preach the gospel to that person. Um, It is not God's will, in terms of His revealed will, what He has said in the Scriptures, that the name of Christ should be restricted from any segment of humanity. We are impelled outwards um, with a desire to preach that gospel. Yet because of this doctrine, we shouldn't be in the case of imagining that person as someone um, who is just blissfully ignorant of God and I would be happy to agree with God um, and to be saved if only someone would tell me how might that happen. Um, Because of the picture of the universal call, our knowledge of God, our true knowledge of God that we suppress, the picture is rather of someone who says, I know enough about that God to know I reject him and I am living my own will. And so God is just um, to condemn them without the gospel call um, because they are not merely ignorant and in a neutral state. They are actively resisting the knowledge they have. Now, one more thing that this is a little more speculation, but I think that doesn't answer the question, um, what would happen to a person in those circumstances who by the, the mercy of God actually begins to respond to what light they have? Um, and instead of rejecting God begins to say, I want to know this God, which we, we attribute to that. That is also the, the work of the Lord. Um, no heart can do that on their own. I find it interesting, um, Josh and I were talking about this, um, how many testimonies you hear from the closed Muslim world of people responding to dreams um, of Christ being revealed to them in a dream and um, turning away and being saved where the, the first revelation is of Christ appearing in a dream to them. Um, in our little teeny community in West Virginia, one of my fellow pastors was driving around somebody's farm, and not even in Franklin, which is small, I was out in the, the, the hills outside of Franklin and came to a farm and a, one of the family said, have you met this person who just moved in down here and went, I think he was from Iraq or maybe Iran. Um, and he said, I was born Muslim. I never heard the gospel. I, uh, I had a dream in which Jesus appeared to me and told me that Muhammad was a fra- false prophet. And I believed the dream. And because of that, I started... Um, looking for um, who Jesus was, and I left the country, and I became a Christian. You think, wow. And that's not an entirely uncommon testimony. I bet some of you guys could give other examples of places where you say, here's, here's someone in a closed country who the Lord appears to them in a way that draws them to seek the revelation of Scripture. It doesn't replace, you know, um, it is a God manifesting himself in a way that calls them towards the church and towards the ordinary means of grace, but he does so in a place where human, humanly speaking, that is very difficult to do. I just take those and say, well, the Lord doesn't give us enough to know how he does all that, but he gives us enough to say no one is condemned to hell um, in a neutral state. And when in the mercy of God, he chooses to reveal himself, even in a place where every human external factor appears to be against it, God is quite capable of revealing himself and summoning someone out of that darkness into light. And I know of other testimonies, people have said they, someone appeared to, a, I think this was, this was also in Iran, where Christ appeared to them in a dream and told them to go to this town and someone would tell them about the true God. And a missionary shows up. And you think, that's a remarkable story. Mm-hmm. That is the Lord sovereignly giving a gospel call, if you will, without human hands that doesn't bypass the means, the ordinary means of grace and the necessity of a church, but summons someone and puts them in the place where they will encounter God because he knows them by name. That's not something scripture gives us a ton about. It doesn't room to say, all right, we should give up. We can abandon missions because it's a lot easier for God to send people dreams than it is for us to go to unreached people groups. It's more to point us to um, in the mercy of God that if someone does respond, which is also the mercy of God, he is quite capable of, of drawing them to himself and bringing them to the place where they experience saving knowledge of Christ. Yeah, it's, it's one of those remarkable things where they are saved in no other way than we are saved. Faith in the the word of Christ. Yet God has supernatural means of orchestrating things that someone might encounter the ordinary means of grace and place their faith. So I think that those are helpful to me because it reminds me, one, um, that picture of my son making eye contact. There's nobody who has not made eye contact with God. I know it in my own heart. Every individual, to some degree, consciously and personally rebelled against the Lord. 
Um, but because God is gracious, when we make it, we respond to the light that we have, which is him, he is prior to even that response. He's quite capable of um, summoning that person to himself in whatever way he chooses, that uses the ordinary means of grace, but might supernaturally bring someone to those ordinary means of grace. Is that helpful? Um, that's a, it's a big topic, but uh, I think that's enough to say, uh, here's, a, here's some, uh, a framework in which to think about it. All right, I think I was going to have us go back to that um, statement of faith and make an argument about why we're not hyper-Calvinists. But I think we've laid the frame. You know, hyper-Calvinism is God will save those he chooses. We don't need to do anything. Um, I think we've laid the framework for that.